So these were fantastic presentations. And <clears throat> I was kind of happy that Aaron was going a little dark, but then he kind of picked it up at the end, unfortunately, because we were, we're, all, we're all so kind of happy. You know, it's not happy is too much, but it's clearly um, a place of excitement, even though we're all grappling with the ethics of it. And you know, Mark was talking about the fact, and so was Hillary, we're establishing a new baseline. Um, and I really love the idea of the escrow and of institutions, cultural institutions, kind of testing and prototyping the way to protect and uh, preserve data and filter them. Um, we're all clearly quite positive um, about this new world even if we're talking about jungle. Is there anybody here that has a non-stereotypical and yet negative view of the way big data are going? But non-stereotypical. See, I, I catch your legs completely by saying. <laughs> no. But how many uh, data scientists are in the audience? Can you raise your hand? Oh, I thought more. Come on. Two. All right. And so nobody wants to admit. To nobody it wants to admit. Well, I found really interesting, you know, Hillary, how you explain data science, and uh, and then you know Mark talked about the digital humanities. Clearly, it's very interesting. Digital humanities, data scientists, are science and humanities um, used interchangeably in this new world? Is there a, a missing definition? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think they're used. I, I mean, the digital humanities. Well, Lev can speak to this easier. Than I can, but the, um, I think it depends on who you, you talk to. I think in the, di the digital humanities will probably always be a minority exercise in the humanities, um, oh. uh, and that or the digital side of it, and that I think there's active work. Hmm. Um, uh, people are using data scientific tools in different ways. I think I think the, the point I was trying to make earlier was that as each discipline finds its core artifacts digitized, they're now data. And so you can look around and you can say, oh, computer science or statistics or whatever, they deal with data. Um, and you can be colonized in a way by their methods and tools, or you can start to build on your own. And part of what I'd like to see the journalists do is, and part of the reason why I have these classes, is to, is to get them building. Because when a journalist or a human, humanist starts to build tools to look at data, they will be inflected with the the ethics and values of their discipline, which are very different than so computer beautiful. science. So beautiful, yeah, you're right. And so, so the, and, and I think that also the in the digital humanities, there, it's it's it's, it's not science. And it's, well, there are some researchers who are trying to make the humanities more scientific, and there are others who are trying to apply scientific tools to non-scientific ends to keep the conversation going, to try a new way of looking at something. And again, I think it's it's a it's a question of of that of your of your ethics and values and how, how you're going to, to, to grapple with what's happening to the to the core of your field. That's quite great. Hilary, I see you nodding. Do you want to add to this? Oh yeah, I mean I, I agree with this. I also spend a lot of time um, not in the academic world, but rather in the world of people who are trying to build businesses and products and those things are perhaps centered around data or enhanced by data but are not um, creatively informed by data. And so there often is this uh, false tension between creativity and quantitative thinking, and that's completely right. wrong, right. like absolutely wrong. Yeah, it's quite beautiful. And the world of music presents this in a particularly glaring way, right? Yeah, I'm sure that that debate that happened with the music industry is not the only place that that very ridiculously polarized notion. No, I know what is good when place. it happens when it happens in the music industry, it's great because it touches everybody. You know, everybody's interested in music. So mm -hmm. there's no in between. We're not talking about anything highfalutin, so people get really involved. But um, um, what did you think of there was also that news about the algorithm that would design the right movie. I mean we saw a little bit with House of House of Cards, but mm -hmm. um, how much um, how much is human and how much is algorithmic in a successful um, music venture? I mean, I'm going to give the answer that every designer gives, which is <laughs> it depends on the context. Right, because you were saying <laughs> that data is as good as its context. Yeah, right? it depends on the context. And like, I think if there's one important takeaway, it's that these are all just tools of a designer's toolkit, and it really depends on the problem that you are trying to solve. There's no one way to do things. It's the same way, you know, you wouldn't try and like hammer in a nail with a screwdriver. You just need but to like use the right FM, tool. But like in Last FM, in Last FM, how much 
human input was so there. So at Last FM there was none, none. and um, I th that was that was probably because at the time we were very interested in what we could do <coughs> with big data because that had never been done before in music. Right. But I do think that over time um, it did sort of like become maybe more of a a law than it perhaps needed to be. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Not speaking for the company, that's my opinion. And there were maybe were some editorial things or some curated things that could have made it more interesting that didn't um, didn't happen. They were just shut down because they were not part of sort of the um, idea, the ethos of what that company was about. And it's um, really nice you're saying because it was the beginning so there's always this moment of effervescence. You want to try the new tools so let's not hu use humans at all, right? Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I mean, this is again just my own opinion but I believe that in technology, often the people that are on the forefront of that, it's like the thing that's new is better <laughs> sometimes, we think, until we use it for a little while. And then we're like, well, you know what, maybe maybe it's just another thing for us mm -hmm. to use, and this old thing is also still good. Yeah, definitely. But don't you feel this, Paula? I mean, don't you feel the at some point the tension between uh, curation, editor editorial, connoisseurship, and sort of data-driven practice. The museum collects lots of statistics about how many people walk through the door, about I what kind of I never feel attention. I just feel or, it's a process. I mean, how, right, how you make use of it, right? That well, um, there was a slide in my presentation that dealt, you know, Paula had put it together that dealt with how the museum uses data, and we decided to take it out because it was a little boring. You know, that's, what, that's the funny thing. So we use data in very predictable ways. I mean, maybe one day we'll use it in an unpredictable way, like, you know, m measuring where the earthquake epicenter happened. Um, and, uh, and I hope so, because that's the creative or haphazard use of data that I feel propels us forward in interesting ways and sometimes in scary ways. So far, we have a great, actually, um, I think Diana is here, right? Diana, are you here? Diana Simpson? I mean, she gathers all the data for moments. She's quite amazing. She can predict visitation on rainy days, non-rainy days, I mean, like within 200, a margin of 200. So there's a, definitely a know-how but I think it's her and her collaborators more than it is the algorithms. So um, I think it's a, a museum is a good example of something that is closer to music, where we know enough about human weaknesses and, 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 and spots and preferences that we can predict. And also, we're small enough. I don't know how it gets afterwards. But, um, Aaron, you touched very briefly on the European privacy laws and on the exclusionary rules. And as you were you were speaking, I was thinking one of the ways in which search engines like Google have tried to get around the problems or to convince governments is in Europe is by saying it's all or nothing. If we can have it all, we can find ways to predict, to go backwards, to analyze. If you start closing up some parts, then we will lose uh, the potential to give you what you need. It's almost like a, it made me think of the vaccination crisis that is happening right now. You know? So uh, this idea that either big data is completely available or, um, or not, and that there's no in-between. How do you feel about this in terms of its use? I mean, history has always been lossy, right? I mean, I mean, lossy? Lossy. I mean, it's always been incomplete. We've always gone. Oh, I'm learning a new word. Yeah. It, oh, sorry. It's, you know, you, uh, <laughs> we're missing great, huge gaps. And, 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 you know, so I think the, the, the attraction to the big data right now is this idea that, you know, we can build a perfect mirror world, that we can go back and it is that, you know, the holodeck. Um, when Google says we won't be able to do anything unless we have everything, everything, I'm just like, you guys, <laughs> that's a bit disingenuous. I'm like, oh, really? Right. I thought you guys were smart. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, no right. offense for anyone from Fair Google enough. here, but it's just like, <laughs> I mean. Um, Fair enough. So, well, you know, I mean, I, th I guess the part of the, one of the reasons that I'm actually excited about trying to find some way to do this that in, a ma in a manner that doesn't like completely creep everyone out in the present is that we have the opportunity to stop kneecapping the future. Like, it's, what do you mean by kneecapping? If we collect this data, it's not so much what we'll do with it in the present. Right? Like, everyone suffers from this idea of like, 
I won't see the result of my efforts in my lifetime. And that's perfectly natural. But it's like, what if we could collect all of this data and then in 100 years someone could figure out something awesome to do with it because it was there, because they didn't have to go back and do yeah, all that legwork. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> well, I mean, we could get into issues of control and access at that point. Mm -hmm. And the consequence to the present, because I think it's a bit of, you know, like I said, it's a bit of a mess right now. Yeah, true. So there's so many people here. Lev, of course. Yeah, <laughs> but you, you're condensed, huh? <laughs> no, you're a great data scientist you're and visualizer. You're very good with predictive analytics on who is going to ask what. So you know, that, you know what I'm going to ask a question, and you know what I'm going to be long. So it's, it's, good. it's <laughs> good. Okay, very short. Um, so since we have such an amazing kind of group of smart data practitioners and thinkers, can you help me to answer like a question which keeps me up at night for eight years? Yes, we have more data than 20 or 200 years ago. How come we're still using techniques from 200 years ago? Right? All our statistical graph, graphs were invented by 1830. And what we do with big data is we aggregate it, we summarize it, we divide people into groups. Right? The computer can keep track of millions of people and millions of actions. So why do we kind of think about big data using the mental techniques and visual techniques from 200, 250 years ago. Who wants to answer this? Mm -hmm. I also wonder about this. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think we, we are starting to see uh, people building infrastructure on sort of different paradigms, looking at probabilistic models rather than sort of, you know, segmenting and analyzing in certain ways. But it, it, is, it is a great existential question. I think um, you're also seeing um, a lot more creativity in places outside the traditional data sciences. So in design and so on, you're starting to see the prevalence. And again, it comes, it comes down in a way to how expressive tool sets are. So, you know, if you're, and I, and I know you're an R user, if you're using R, there's a limit to, uh, to the kinds of, gra your graphics come from the 60s, your graphic engine is from the 60s. Um, and, and so, you know, you have, um, the, the tool set is leading you there. What, what I think the promise of, a, of at least data science as it sort of mambos its way into the academy would be the ability for different disciplines to share experiences for the designers and their tool set, the architects and their tool sets, what have you, like the different ways of experiencing things to come together to, 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 to help beef up places where, where graphics and things are a little lagging. Uh, Modeling-wise, I think we're doing a lot better. The, the graphic side, I think, is, is not, um, d d does need some help. I think By the way, Lev is the person that did that beautiful uh, visualization of the photography. Sorry, go ahead. Well, just oh, to add too. a little bit, we yeah. also see this tension where, particularly on the academic side of our field, the field itself enforces those behaviors that have always been done. So if you want to publish something, it has to be comparable to what's been done before, and so you have to use those techniques. And uh, it's been very interesting to see a lot of the creative stuff happening um, from people who are outside of that entirely. Jane? Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, aren't wait, wait, hold on. Aren't algorithms written by people? Sure. <laughs> I yeah. mean, in terms of the person versus the algorithm, somebody wrote the algorithm. Aaron yes. just said for now. <laughs> by the way, we're going to have a solo so, algorithm. So there's not necessarily an opposition there. I mean, to Mark's point, I think that's where the creativity comes in, is writing the algorithms. Sure, but it's a question of how open that is and how openly specified. So if you take on a, an algorithm as a creative partner, if you don't understand anything about what's going on in the box, um, you know, there's a limit to, to, to the conversation you can have, the, the limit to how well you can use it, right? I mean, a hammer, as you mentioned earlier, a hammer's pretty easy, right? It has like a really simple API, but there are a lot of, uh, that was a joke, there's a lot of, uh, a oh, lot really? of tool sets that are, yes, there are a lot of tool sets that are um, much more complicated and you, you just don't have any transparency into it or you need maybe an advanced degree in computer science to have it explained to you or something like that, right? And so, so there's, there, is, there is something to be said about transparency and openness of, al of, of, of algorithms when you take them on as a, as a creative partner. Yeah, and we don't, we don't have a shorthand for what algorithms represent. We don't have the equivalent of a legend on a map. 
when you see a data visualization to understand the sort of meat grinder that it's gone through. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important because um, a, a lot of people just look at it and they're like, truth! And yeah, what you're not seeing are the decisions that shape the result. So I think a lot of times the tool comes before the problem, at least in my experience, an algorithm gets created because someone gets excited oh, about how they can make a data set. And then mm -hmm. that exists. Fine. Now it's there as an API. But I come along as a designer and I'm like, okay, well, I'm trying to solve a problem for a person or understand something or create something for a user. And it's like, well, we need a slightly different thing than what this algorithm <laughs> is giving me here. So. Um, Yes, you're right that like there is a human at the end of it, but sometimes I think you have to, um, it's a very opaque journey to get to that human as we were talking about. It's, um, it's, it's not always that easy. And sometimes you're led to take on an algorithm as a, in, like to wedge it in a, in a creative way because, I mean, uh, Ben and Jared and I have an example where, where an algorithm was requested because the, design, the, the people, the commissioners, the commissioning body thought that, that an algorithm was the same as being objective, right? So that we could, and I tried, I swore up and down, like I tried, you know, they are without doubt systematic, but objective, I mean, you've just swapped your objectivity for our, like our subjectivity, right? I mean, like, anyway, the, uh, people appeal to, to, especially in creative circles, to, to algorithms for a variety of reasons as well. Maria, and then I'm gonna go to the rest. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reminded of that beautiful 1945 essay by Vannevar Bush, As We May Think, in which he uh, presages this new profession of trailblazers that he says will make useful trails through the common record. And I've always loved this notion of the common record is very poetic, but I wonder with big data, because it gives us this illusion of looking very wide and, and having um, more of a view over a section of the record. It's actually doing the opposite of making it more narrow and the record is no longer common. I mean, because it's so vast, we only ever, as individuals, get a chance to glimpse fragments of it. So I guess I wonder how you feel about the, this fragmentation of the common record as we have more and more information from big data, but less and less integrated knowledge of these different fragments with each other. Is, is that the case? I mean, can visualization help? Um, do things really get fragmented, or is there a way instead to zoom in and out and have Mark? Uh -oh. or, uh, so yeah. I would. I, I, so <laughs> every every discipline needs its white whale, and statistics has something called the curse of dimensionality, which there um, uh, which is about how data get. I see you smiling, Hannah. <laughs> which is how data get more and more detailed the space that 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 you live in takes on different characteristics so as i start to record more and more about you you become the point nearest you the person nearest you and the person farthest the person farthest from you are sort of about the same distance away and so it's sort of hard to tell you become kind of an island right which sort of makes sense like the more i know about you it could only be you Right? And, and data has that same kind of thing. And so there's a, at some point, there's a difficulty in sort of basing learning algorithms without doing some kind of reduction or, or having to deal with that, that curse of d dimensionality. Sorry to. You were so. about to say something, Eric? Yeah, I guess, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about is this idea that, that you know, we used to measure merit and value on the inclusion in a list or something, right? You got, you got published in a book when books were still hard to, they, they were burdensome to produce. Um, and then in a world of databases, you know, we're, we're not short of places to put all this stuff. And so I think what people are being forced to reconcile with is this idea that inclusion no longer confers notability, right? So, so yeah, I mean, the dynamic around, you know, a very tight spotlight on a particular part of the whole <coughs> remains. But you know, before, there was the spotlight and then just a vacuum of nothing. And now what we maybe have, if we can do this right, is we still have the spotlight, but we actually do have all that other stuff. And it doesn't guarantee that someone will find it, but at least it's there, right? Like, we spent most of recorded history with the spotlight and nothing, and now maybe we have something. 
Um, Susan. Susan. Thank you all, it's fantastic. Um, the comment that, Hannah? No, music industry. Yeah, yeah. Hannah. Yeah. Hannah, yeah. I, right, okay. That you made about the tool coming before the application is interesting. It's reminded me of what happened in the crash and how in 2008. Algorithms that people were hot on at MIT and found so creative were not gauged in terms of potential. Um, they came before the crash, as it were, but they facilitated the crash, which leads me back to Aaron's um, exclusionary rule and my favorite phrase, post conspicuously. What should you post conspicuously if you could do it? You, you've sort of given an invitation, you know, all of you. You indicated that maybe it's just too hard to talk about, it's too hard to explain an algorithm, but. I love the idea of posting conspicuously. I still have a bizarre 1950s faith in the potential of propaganda, for good, actually. Um, I guess, I, I don't know who was, was talking about algorithms. It was the question of, you know, algorithms are written by people and, well, maybe they won't be eventually. But then you're like, what are we supposed to do with algorithms that are written by algorithms? And so maybe, maybe the argument behind the post conspicuously phrase is that things have an audit trail, that, that things are said aloud by a community to the community. And so that's, that's what sort of struck me about the, the Department of Health permit in the restaurant. I mean, you could, you could easily imagine crafting like a nightmare scenario around going to a restaurant. You, have, you never see the food, you never see the kitchen. Like, there's all kinds of reasons why it would be just like, why would anyone do that? Um, and we do for a lot of reasons, and one of them is, is that we do have institutions like the Department of Health, and that there is, you know, a degree of accountability and responsibility, and and that everyone stands up and asserts something about what they're doing. So, the funny thing is that I I thought that post conspicuously meant postmodernism. Pers <laughs> I, mean, I was like, what the hell does that mean? Um, if I may in inject something, even though I shouldn't. Um, I thought that it also what Mark said was extremely important, which is um, it's not only about curating, posting, conspicuously or not. It's also about giving people the critical tools to evaluate what they find in front of them, which I always thought that it's our job as curators in a museum. It's like, especially in design, it's to give the critical tools. So I like that fact. It's not only about posting conspicuously, but it's also about educating so that people are critical or skeptical of the post conspicuous <laughs> post. Mm -hmm. Wait, there was uh, a very, there. yeah, you. Mm -hmm. Wait, you need, uh, there's a microphone coming. And then if, uh, in the back, if anybody has a question, raise your hand high so I can see you. No, okay, perfect, <coughs> then I'm doing fine. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I was kind of uh, fascinated when you said uh, statistics don't lie, people <laughs> lie. Oh. Well, um, statistics, statistics can lie, depending on how the people present those. Is that true? Uh, well, okay, I'm, a people that like by, I'm a statistician <laughs> by training, so I'm going to stand up for, my, for my, the ethics <laughs> of my field. Um, uh, uh, all I was saying is that something, some inert thing that you've computed and put up on a piece of paper, so, I mean, that, that that's not, like, this thing you've computed doesn't lie. It's how you present it and what you do with it. Right, that you can compute a billion different things that mean that mean nothing, right? But the presentation of it as something that's the that's the that to me feels like the issue. Here, I, wait, a microphone coming down here, please. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you all. It was a, an incredible, as always, actually, it was an incredibly thought-provoking session. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to sort of ask or add is um, the, the cultural heritage aspect. And um, there's a wonderful um, Walter Benjamin quote, um, or it's actually a whole essay, uh, which comes down to a kind of comparison uh, between knowledge that's um, transferred by way of storytelling and knowledge that's transferred by way of information and the loss in information. And he has this, I mean, I, I will not be able to kind of say it right now, but he has this wonderful quote of how the narrative is actually the story plunges 
the listener into the depths of the storyteller and, and back out or something like that, in the sense that the story always contains part of the experience, whether it's a story that actually pertains to the storyteller or even whether the storyteller is repeating the story, there's always some kernel of human experience that's part of that and it becomes part of the knowledge transfer, which is lacking in information. And so one of the things I'm curious about is how we would um, approach that Walter Benjamin thought from the point of view of data, uh, whether, you know, there, there's an, another level of loss in some ways. I mean, there's always something gained at the same time. We, we all know that, and we're, we're very sort of enthusiastic about that. But, but what's a concern is whether we are, in all of our enthusiasm, moving in a direction where the primary mode of knowledge collection and transfer is now happening more and more through data and no longer through storytelling, and, and what answer. that sort of um, may imply. Um, so as, as someone in a journalism no, school, <laughs> no, 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 as, I, I, as someone in a journalism school, we, I mean, yeah, part of what we're trying to do is, is train people to, to have more nuanced be able to, to tell stories in a more nuanced way. So it doesn't have to start with the anecdotal lead that puts a face on a number, but there could be other ways to tell that story, whether it's through visualization or what have you. I, you know, I would add, it, there was an, I was on the job for two weeks when I got called up by the CIA. And they called and they said, hello, I'm Robert M. I'm from the CIA. And when he came, his card said Robert M. Um, <laughs> Period. Like, and his partner was Samantha S. The period. Like, it was very spooky. But he said, "I would like to talk to you about, like, maybe working with you at the institute or something like that." And I said, "All right." The CIA calls. How often do? I mean, yeah. why not? Cool. Right. Well, I didn't. Well, yeah, I probably said cool. So <laughs> I just because this was going to be an experience, I knew that I would be in a room eventually that I'd be able to tell the story in. So I meet them, and and uh, they explain to me that. Um, they're interested in hiring data scientists because they have a, a pile of data, as, and I'm thinking, yeah, and, um, and, that, uh, uh, and that they can hire data scientists you know, until the cows come home, but it, they've, it's been really hard to find one that can tell a story. And to them, an uh, intelligence product is a story. Following a journalistic line of inquiry through a data set that's what they're interested in. And they couldn't find, because that's not in our training, you know, as sort of data science, statistics, whatever. I, I, my training stopped before it actually touched the world. I kind of enjoyed a certain remove from the real world, um, and things lived in a level of kind of math. Um, and so, so there was this moment where he's like, I, you know, we'd really love to be able to work with you because we're interested in hiring these people. And I said, well, you know, the journalism school at Columbia, we have this ban on taking any money from the government, and I'd have to get a vote of the full faculty even to get a National Science Foundation grant, much less how do I bring it to them that the CIA wants to fund us. And he goes, oh, don't worry. We have these organizations that we could put money through. Yeah, of course. And, you went, <laughs> and I'm like, oh. This is getting better. Anyway, and so I was like, I, I you know, I, this is, I, I feel for you. We're trying to train people, but there's really nothing. I mean, you, you've, you've at very least given me some information that we're on the right path, um, because this kind of a hybrid person is something that is not just the CIA is looking for, but that's that's something that, that is really quite prized. Um, and then he gave me some some uh, 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 swag, like a, a lanyard, security <laughs> for the, the nation, the CIA, and a little pin. And I ran into my dean going up the stairs. Yeah, a lanyard, that was crazy. But a little CIA pin, and I saw my dean coming up. And I'm like, look where I was. And he was like, ah. like, I have no part of it. Anyway, that's a very long answer to your question, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just quickly, I, I guess what I would say quickly is the good news about now is that it's not an either or choice anymore. That, no, but, but I mean, this was, you know, we had this, you know, because the museum was closed and we were doing all this work around digital stuff and it forced the issue with the curatorial department around the metadata and the stuff they had. And, and you know, we need a sort of high pass filter for the data we have to create a scaffolding of, around the collection. But seriously, what we said to them was, like, please, write all the things. Like, keep writing. You have like, the... Is metadata where the story is? No. <laughs> no, metadata is, metadata is an avenue 
for people to approach a collection, right? Like it turns out the secret is search by color. Yeah. Right? Like we it's unfair and unrealistic of us to expect that, you know, any of you will arrive at the collections website with 40 years of decorative arts knowledge. Yeah, but by color? Oh my god, people love I it. I know that they do. Yeah. yeah, but but that's just but that's fine. That's just the way in. That's just the place to get started and from mm -hmm. there that becomes, you know, then you tell all the stories. Mm -hmm. So. Brindis. Thank Brindis you. Again. It's uh, uh, been great to listen to you. Uh, I have a question. I come from a more pr practical view. Uh, I work in campaigns, political campaigns, issue-based campaigns, <coughs> and you know big data is very valuable to us, especially in America where there are no rules. Sadly enough, I come from Europe, so I'm, I'm still processing that. But uh, I wanted to ask you, there's the newest things in um, buying, micro-targeting is through taste, through musical, um, like Pandora, for example. And I recently went to a conference when all these uh, social media, everyone that had any access to data about people's taste in music, entertainment, the art, whatever it was, they were selling micro-targeting. But I, I haven't seen ac academia following up on what really works, because those are the people who are selling the products, who are measuring it, doing all the statistics, uh, telling us what the micro-targeting works, how the big data is useful. But it's sort of like with the banking industry, there needs to be some more regulations or some kind of facility that regulates it or understands or explains it to us in terms of, is it useful really, or is this, you know, are they using too much data, or is it too less, or, or whatever. I just wanted to get your views on that, both the uh, behavioral science behind the taste, if that you really believe that, and especially in Hannah's case, if she has seen that or used that, and and also from uh, Mark Hansen, uh, how journalists could actually help us understand when we're being sort of bullied to buy something that doesn't really work. Or I'm going to start with the Hannah part, and then because we have very little time, and there's two more people that want to ask questions. So Hannah, about the taste. Sure. I mean, I think people are going to sell whatever they can possibly sell. So, I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, the, the, it will continue to happen. I guess my only comment on that is it only works if there's a big enough pile of it. We tried doing a little bit of that at Last FM, and you just need, you need a lot of people and a lot of taste. Like, you need some seriously big-ass data to be able to do anything interesting there. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I'm kind of interested in future studies, and one of the things that's important about future studies is that we allow a plurality of possibilities. There are many different options as we think about the future. And so in the cases of the generative outputs from big data, like the House of Cards, for example, or the OkCupid okay profile, the ideal OkCupid okay profile, um, we could see them as visualizations of the data in one way, but they're also much more than that. And so I'm wondering what happens to all the orphaned House of Cards is. Like, where did all the other ones go? And what is the role or what is the relationship between our creative capacity as a culture and all the data that's being amassed and being visualized in this other way of visualization? Interesting. Who wants to take this? Who wants to take this big question? Hillary? Hmm? I mean, it sounds like what you're talking about is how uh, recognizing something from data restricts the um, future development of it, perhaps, or, um, or even saying, like, if we're taking a fairly immature metric, like more people clicked on House of Cards than on the other 19 pilots, what happens to those creative efforts? Um, and that's really, I think that's not so much a question of data as it is, and it, this is actually something that I've been thinking about the whole time we've been sitting up here. We have all hit on this, uh, this tension in data analysis where we draw data from individuals' behavior and study it in aggregate, and then we try and project back onto individuals, yeah. right? And, and there's something that does not work when you do that last bit. And that's something that many people fail to understand and is in fact why most micro-targeting is complete bullshit. Um, and, and I think your, your question, I have no good answer for it, but, it, but it, it's essentially hitting on that same theme of, you know, what if we have sort of a tyranny of big data and we lose out on these creative opportunities? And I'd say the answer is get good data scientists, not crappy ones, but, you know, I obviously have a biased perspective on that. You could also argue, though, that actually having some of that data offers more of a creative opportunity because with House of Cards, for example, they knew that there were certain themes that they thought would be successful, and so that actually could give a writer 
more leeway to play around with that because you know that the project is most likely to be funded. I mean, when pilots are in development, you know, they land on the cutting room floor very quickly. And so having a little bit of space and time to know that this might be something you could work on or develop or write, I don't know, it could also be useful. I think it's just the age-old tension of creativity and then testing your work, which is nothing new. I mean, people have been doing that forever, putting their work in front of audiences. And also surprises. I remember there used to be a TV channel that lasted like three months that was all pilots, right? A few years ago. <laughs> pilots that didn't go any forward. Am I dreaming? I just like, I remember that there was one. Um, yeah, actually, it was this, well, okay, you, no, no, you can take it, and then the last person is this lady with the scarf here. Okay, I just wanted to turn it back to the museum, um, and when I think about the relationship between data and the museum, I think of one of my favorite sayings, which is, to the person who has a hammer, everything seems like a nail. So I want to propose the situation in which we're looking at now, which is the API may, may be that hammer and the museum may then appear as a nail to an institution that has an API. So I just really want to kind of interrogate that. Like, why does the museum uh, need an API? Aaron? Um, for the same reason that, uh, for the same reason that anyone, any service has an API. Um, so on the one hand, you know, we have an API, we use it ourselves. We, for just for like, just functional purposes on the website. Um, but also to open up that space for other people to imagine how that data is crafted, what it, what it looks like, what you do with it, right? I mean, um, I, did a, I did a talk at a mapping conference a couple of years ago, and I pointed out to people that if we treated language the same way that we treat map data, we would not have humor, philosophy, history, anything, right? You know, and, and the opportunity with all that map data was to think about it as a, as a narrative tool. So I guess that would be the short answer. But also, we know how when to turn it off. Like I, I was talking to some colleagues in Australia who told me something that shocked me, that in many cases, uh, curators have to present their ideas for exhibitions not only to their colleagues, but also to focus groups. So um, using APIs and using focus groups is not the difference. So depending on the institution, there are institutions that allow you to do something unexpected, not necessarily test it, and others that don't. But at the same time, it's, it's interesting to uh, test some of the tools. But if so, I can add oh, that, so, like, sure. APIs don't have to, like, the API is just an, an, I mean, the I is just an interface, right? So it's, it's just a, a gateway to a set of services that yeah. you have crafted or you have designed. The API doesn't mean that you've opened yourself up to, to I mean, uh, we're doing a project with MoMA and one of the APIs we were thinking about was um, you could, could only be unlocked if you're with another person, right? So the two of you together unlock something and that, that, that sort of mimics your experience in the museum of how, you know, I used to, I, this guy I dated, ugh. but anyway, we would go through the museum and he would stop at like all these different places and I would usually stop and force me to look at, 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 at paintings that I would never have looked at before but in the process go, wow. And so that, that idea of an API now um, maybe being present to help you know, uh, support some kind of other activity. I mean, it's just an interface and what you choose to do with it and how you choose to release the data and under what conditions. It's a source of incredible creativity. Yeah, that's so perfectly said. Yes, last question. So this is a good, I guess, follow-up question to that, and it's what is the museum experience in an age of data, and how much value can we put on the actual experience of being present in the museum as opposed to seeing uh, something like a, a piece from the MoMA online in its digital collection um, without any context, without anything, or being in the museum without seeing it interact with other context. pieces. Yeah, different, different contexts. Context. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to see what, what is the museum experience uh, in the age of data? Do you want to answer? Uh, very quickly, it's, um, it's the same and hopefully it's as different as it can be every single day. So I think that our culture is different. So the museum becomes a different place because of what we project onto it. And the fact that it has a website and it has projects that happen only online should be an, something that enriches 
the experience that you can have there physically if you can. I showed briefly that beautiful project by Leah Dickerman about inventing abstraction and finding new readings by connecting networks of, uh, uh, of artists and cultural leaders um, at that time in Europe and in the United States. And that's another reading. So I think that, um, once again, it's about enriching the experience. It's about living in, in the contemporary possibilities. And you know, it's about also sharpening people's critical tools so that they know what to take from each different platform. So I would say I'm very trusting of people. And I'm very trusting of my colleagues. We try to make the best out of the tools of our disposal. APIs included, to give a richer experience every single time. So I'm going, yeah. To, yeah. Well, I guess I would just, I mean, this is, this is personally, for me, it, it is, um, you know, what changes in the building. So right now, it, in a lot of museum circles, everyone's really excited about Oculus Rift and like <laughs> AR technology. And I'm just like, Cool. Can we just go home? Yes. Because, like, I mean, but seriously, like, we've invalidated the entire purpose for the buildings and for the stuff. So for me, it is, what does it mean? What does it mean for the museum to extend beyond the visit itself? What does it mean when you can use all of the infrastructure and technology around you and have the museum just be present and have it not actually be? an experience, but just like, right? Like, I do this a lot where I'm like, the cool, the most important thing about an interaction like this, blah, 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 is this, right? Like, that's, the fact that we can pull a piece of a thing out and talk to the sky and like, blah, blah, all of human knowledge and cat photos, mm -hmm. and then put it away and keep going, that's awesome, so. Well. I'm sorry for all the questions that I haven't been able to take. I'm sure there were many, but we can keep on talking outside with drinks. And I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank my great four panelists. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you so much. So let's go have a drink. <laughs> <laughs>